feel like it's time that these things be said. Ten things for gospel magicians to consider in the 21st century. Even if you don't consider yourself a gospel magician, if you're going to use magic tricks in any way in ministry, these are things to think about. And there we go. Almost everyone's heard the common definition of insanity. Insanity is when you keep on doing the same thing in the same way while expecting different results. Now, a strange thing about this definition is almost everybody I talk to has heard this definition before, but almost no one ever seems to think that it applies to him or her. Uh, it's amazing how folks understand the concept, and yet when it comes to their own personal situation, uh, they don't seem to see the need to change for things to change. I've seen it in churches. People in congregations voice concern that our church is not growing, our church is losing its young people, yet these same people want to do the same things in the same way. And you can't get it in their heads. It's not going to change unless we change. I've seen it in the world of gospel magicians, in particular with the Fellowship of Christian Magicians. I love that group. But I get so frustrated. I hear them say, look how many members we've lost. We used to have thousands of people. Now we have hundreds. Now we used to have all these people at convention. Now we're having trouble with people getting there. And yet as soon as change starts getting discussed, they say, well, well, we have to keep doing it this way. and We can't stop doing that. This is a part of it. Well, if you don't change, it's not going to change. We live in a continually changing world. If we don't change, we get left behind. Now, some people have suggested that change isn't a good thing because it would be a compromise. They say, well, God's Word doesn't change, so why should we change? You know, it's up to God to do this sort of thing. And that represents a serious misunderstanding of Scripture. For the Bible teaches that God's truth never is compromised. His message doesn't change, but methods do change. And it's part of the Christian responsibility to change when culture mandates it. A very powerful scripture in this matter is 2 Corinthians 9, 19-23, where the Apostle Paul discussed his ministry, and he said, if I'm working with the Jews, well, then I, I know I need to act like the Jews do. But if it's Gentiles, I, I can't do what I do with the Jews. I've got to do it differently with them. And those without the law, I, I like without the law. He throw, tosses in, he says, I keep honoring Christ. You know, I don't disobey God's word, but I still realize I've got to relate to these heathen people in ways they understand. I'm all things to all men that I might win some. Methods have to change. If gospel magicians are going to be effective in these modern times, there are some places where we seriously need to readjust our thinking. Ten things that we, where we need to do some serious thought. Number one, we need to educate ourselves about digital technology. Face it, it is the digital age. Nowadays, when churches book a performer, they do not ask you to send an 8x10 through the mail. They want video, and they want you to be able to send them your promotional material in a digital form, or they want to be able to access it from your website. You say, well, I'm too old to learn this computer stuff. Uh, well, I'll tell you this much. If you do not set aside that kind of attitude, you will be set aside. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. We have to accept the fact that this is the way the world's going. So we have to learn some stuff. I'm an old dog, but I have to learn new tricks. And if I don't, I might as well forget about being effective in ministry. In context of performance, CD players, even CDs are becoming a thing of the past. Three weeks ago, Best Buy announced they're no longer going to sell CDs <coughs> because everything now is from the cloud or in other forms. Uh, a phone, a laptop, some other digital device is what people are using to play their music. You show up to a local church, their sound system, you're going to see computers. And along with the computers, and the digital technology allows us to have playlists, allows us even to preset volumes on things. You show up with an outdated music player and you want them to fast forward or rewind to find your songs, you're going to be looked at as out of touch with the times and one who's probably not credible. We simply have to learn how to use these new tools. Another way that the digital age has changed things is many churches uh, do a lot with video. Very common to come in with the big projection screens. And they want to project what's going on. So we have to learn how to be comfortable in front of a camera. And we need to learn how to use things to our advantage, such as Keynote and PowerPoint. Uh, churches are so used to seeing things visualized that they'll feel like something's missing. And, and if nothing else, you can show up with some sort of file so they can put your picture up on the screen or a key verse, just something to accompany what's going on. 
And a really very practical concept for the digital age is we can no longer announce the names of our tricks, which I never did anyway. I mean, why tell the audience you're going to do confabulation or whatever it is? There's no point in that. But I know people who do it. Why can you not do it? Because they'll look it up on their phone and they'll learn how the trick, trick works while you're trying to do it for them. And so instead of listening to your message, they're going to be distracted by the method. So if you do feel a need to name your tricks and announce the names, you better come up with your own names, get creative. But we have to face the fact that it's a digital world. Number two, a key main area where things have to change is the matter of political correctness and the sensitivity of society against intolerance and prejudice. See, I appreciate the applause on this because I know that some yeah. folks resist it because you're hanging on to the past and you've got to let go. And that is, I'm not talking about compromising our message. I'm talking about building bridges instead of barriers. And I'm saying there are some things that simply don't need to be said. There's no reason to voice open criticism of a popular celebrity or a government leader. There's no reason to chase people away by, your, by way of voicing your political opinions. And you may be confident your opinion's right, but you still are going to alienate somebody by way of this opinion, and if you're there to share the gospel, it's just not necessary to say it. And in the past, my association with gospel magicians, I've known a number who have thought that it's clever to make disparaging remarks about politicians while they're on stage, and they get a laugh by, by way of the audience that supports their point of view, but they don't seem to get the fact that if you're a Democrat, not everybody in the audience is a Democrat. If you're a Republican, not everybody in the audience is a Republican. And unless you're there lobbying for a particular vote of some kind, uh, then keep your political opinions to yourself because we're there to reach for Christ. There is a place for political opinions, but it's not in this sort of thing. And beyond those, that, that world of you know, political issues that can be so offensive, beyond that, we just need to, to be more careful because society has become more careful. For example, I am not a health food nut. I work out, I try to take care of myself, but I do not eat organic, and tofu is never going to go into my mouth. Uh, that's just not going to happen. And the same thing with kale. I hear everybody talk about it and find out miracles it's going to do for me. But me and kale are not going to become friends. But if I, during the course of a program, make jokes about these things, and uh, sort of mock or put down, I can hurt my ministry because there are a lot of young dads and moms out there. I'm amazed. I have four children, and every one of them eats organic and eats healthy. They didn't get it from me, but they all do, and they all, you know, grandkids, they get a warning. Grandpa's going to try to put sugar in it. You know, you put sugar in it. But, but the point is, I have to know that I've got people out there trying to get their kids to eat right, and if I'm the speaker and I'm up there mocking health, health thing, I'm going to turn some of these parents against me. They're going to wish they hadn't brought the kids to hear me. And so even though I may think it's funny, I just got to learn, no, don't, don't say those kind of things if they're going to get in the way of ministry, especially when it comes to discriminatory remarks. I mean, God loves and equally values all people, no matter what color, no matter what ethnicity. Uh, the testimony of the gospel magician must be caring for everybody. And again, I say I'm not talking about compromising truth. I'm talking about not saying things that don't need to be said. These are new times. It is a new generation. I grew up in a culture, uh, frankly, being very open with you, I grew up in a family where you were taught to believe it because I said so. And I went to churches where the pastor says it, you believe it. I mean, that's just the way it goes. You respect authority. And so they say it, and that's good enough. Doesn't work nowadays. Nope. You say something, they pull out their phone. They look it up. Is that accurate? Is that right? You just told that story. You got your facts wrong. You're not credible. You make a political opinion, they're going to turn on CNN or Fox or whatever they happen to like, and they're going to find somebody just as credible with, as you with another opinion. And so the whole point is, why get into non-scriptural issues that antagonize people? Instead, more than ever before, gospel magicians need to stay on message. And the message is what the Bible says and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, drop these, these things that you think are clever, that make people laugh, that don't have to do with Scripture. It just gets in the way of what we're trying to accomplish. Number three, gospel magicians must be careful about remarks and behavior which can be considered as sexist. 
uh, in this day and age, more than ever before, this is a matter in which we need to be about which we need to be extremely wise. Not long ago, I was at an event where an older man who professed, professed to be a Christian approached some attractive young ladies. In fact, there are young ladies that work for me. And he approached them and he said, I don't care what they say about being politically correct. If I think a young lady has nice legs, I tell her. And then he proceeded to what he thought was compliment the young ladies, and they were appalled. And uh, as if, if he had tried later on to share some sort of spiritual message with him, there is no way they would have listened. The man was flat out stupid. But unfortunately, he didn't understand that at all because in his mind, he was still remembering the day and age where a man may have been able to say things like that and get away with it. The world has changed. Reference about a woman's weight or her figure, not acceptable. Jokes about women being silly, not acceptable. When I was younger, and the comment will show you how long ago it was, I heard a preacher say, I think just about every woman I know talks so much you'd think she was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. Now that goes way back when there were phonograph needles. Yeah, look how you respond now. But back then, which was many years ago, it got a big laugh. Nowadays, it's not going to get a laugh. That stuff just isn't appropriate. We've got to drop that. Society has become much more concerned. Push the button, there we go much more concerned about any words or actions from men or women that can be interpreted as sexual harassment. And on stage, this says, among other things, we have to really pay attention about how we touch people. And not just the opposite sex anymore. With the modern culture and the, the gay situation, it doesn't matter whether they're boys or girls. We have to be really careful about any kind of personal contact. And if there is some kind of contact, it has to be unquestionably appropriate. Now, I've run into people, I still run into people who don't like what I'm saying right now. They say all this gender-sensitive and politically correct stuff is foolishness. I don't care what other people think. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to behave like I always have. And my response to that is, do you want to reach people for Christ or not? And if you want to reach people for Christ, why alienate the folks you've come to reach? And if allowing yourself to become more sensitive, of allowing yourself to pull back your sense of humor in certain areas, if that makes you more effective in ministry, then it needs to be done. And I will tell you on my part, I think you can tell I have tremendously strong feelings about this. Uh, you do something that's insensitive to the opposite sex, on insensitive to another race, you will never work for me or be a part of any event that I put on. One thing that I have no tolerance for whatsoever is any kind of prejudice. I just, these, these things, things are tremendously important. Okay, moving on. Uh, number four, if I can push the button, gospel magicians must be careful to treat volunteers from the audience in a polite and Christ-like manner. Now, in the past century, it's amazing the stuff people got away with. Uh, you bring somebody on stage and you make fun of them, you put them in, in very awkward situations. You know, an example which some of you may still use, but frankly, I think this shouldn't even be used anymore. But you ask somebody to help you, not, they offer you a hand, or no, not that hand, the clean hand. Uh, that is putting, some, you know, putting somebody down. And it gets a laugh, it's supposed to be funny, but we have a more sensitive culture than we used to have. Uh, it's crazy when you look at what magicians did in the early days of the 20th century and what they got away with. You know, somebody walks on stage and they say, oh, you must have dressed yourself today. Looks like you were in a hurry. They make fun of how people dress and all this sort of thing. And beyond insults, taking physical advantage of people, spilling water on them, asking them to stand in uncomfortable situations. Now, when I say this, I know there are certain venues where this may still work. And you have to sort some of this stuff out. And there are certain styles where maybe some of this is still deemed humorous, but we just have to accept the fact the world has changed. And one of the big concerns nowadays is bullying. Well, what if you on stage look like a bully? And if you're pushing people around, you're making fun of them, you're putting them in awkward situations, you're basically bullying them. And if the audience deems you a bully, well, then you're done. You know, they're not going to listen to you. And really what it comes down to, and you know, I want to be careful how I say these things, because I know we have different performing styles, we're different personalities, some people can get away with things that other people cannot, but here's what it comes down to. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 teaches us how love behaves. 
One of the things it says is that love does not behave itself unseemly. Love does that which is appropriate. It's well-mannered. And I say this to you. There is nothing about being a magician that ever gives you a right to compromise what you're supposed to be as a Christian. It's Christian first. So it doesn't matter if it gets a laugh. It doesn't matter if magicians have always done it this way. It doesn't matter if it gets applause. If it's not Christ-like, we don't do it. And this should have been guiding us always. So, but I will tell you my experience, and I'm going to share some stories later on. I just, you know, There was a time when you can say things you just can't do. Uh, nowadays. I used to do head chopper routines all the time with all the jokes. Now it's a very rare situation where I would do a head chopper. For a teen retreat, yep, I'd probably still do it. Because, you know, you're dealing with a bunch of teenagers, you got to do something extreme to get their attention. But, you know, otherwise, you know, it's just not in the show like it used to be. We'll keep going here. Gospel magicians should use stories to teach. Uh, it is a fact that in this 20th century, our, our culture has grown up in a media-intensive environment, which means they're especially responsive to engaging narrative and even expect it. Uh, stories have the power to increase interest and comprehension. A simple statement to explain what I'm saying is telling young people don't do drugs and giving them statistics probably won't change. Oh, that's supposed to say change, not chance. Won't change somebody's life. But telling a story about somebody whose life was ruined by drug abuse, telling a story, that may very well change someone's life. Uh, it's just a matter of you, you kind of need to put flesh on the facts. But tied right in with this is also the fact that we have grown accustomed to good stories being told quickly. A commercial on TV in 60 seconds very often tells a story, the whole story with the message. So if we decide storytelling is a good thing, but we begin come guilty of long-winded embellishments, uh, we are going to discover that that is not effective. Uh, I love storytelling, and the Fellowship of Christian Magicians has had a storytelling division for years. But I must tell you that many storytellers, no matter how good they are, bore me rather quickly. And it's not that they're not good at what they do. It's just a matter of, I want to see something. I want some action. I want something visual, too. So, learning to tell stories, and here's my challenge to you in a very practical way, and that is, think about adding some brief, powerful stories in your presentation, your Gospel Magic presentation, that illustrate how somebody's life was changed, or illustrate how somebody made that decision to, to come to Christ, or, or maybe how a wrong decision got them in trouble, whatever it is. But keep these stories short, two or three minutes max. But add that to the, the magic aspect of the show, and I think you'll be surprised at the impact it can help you make. Uh, moving along. Dwayne needs to get a new clicker, talking about technology. But anyway, number six, gospel magicians should be prepared to work with large audiences. The kind of gospel magic primarily demonstrated in the previous century was good for small church settings. Gospel magicians didn't need to worry much about the visibility or the size of the things they did, because most churches weren't very big. Uh, it wasn't until 1955 that uh, the megachurch really became something that our culture was aware of. The definition of a megachurch is a church that has 2,000 people or more attending. It wasn't until actually the 1980s and 90s that those churches really became common. And now, according to the Hartford Institute 2010, their survey, there are more than 1,300 Protestant churches in the United States with 2,000 or more people attending per Sunday. Now, obviously, it's not doesn't average out per state. But if it did, that would be, in every in one of the 50 states, at least 30 churches of 2,000 or more, if you try to get your wrap your mind around that number. Now, I know in South Dakota, obviously, that's not going to happen. But in other places, that means there's going to be more mega churches. And there's a lot of other churches with around 1,000 or so people in them. Now, it's still true that there are more churches in America with less than 100 people in them than there are churches with 1,000 or more. But the point is, there are a lot more big changes. And how this relates to the gospel edition, back up there, is the larger churches tend to be the ones who are most likely to want to use creative ministry. One of the reasons why they are larger is they're aggressive about reaching people. They're thinking in terms of, what do we have to do to get folks who don't come to church to come to church? And that's why they've grown. And with that mentality in mind, they are the ones who may contact a gospel magician and say, can you come and do a program? 
Well, when they contact you, they're going to want to know, can you handle our situation? Can, well, can a thousand people see what you're doing? Uh, can you deal with an audience like this? So it's time to prepare ourselves for that, that opportunity that very may well come our way. Now, this doesn't mean we all have to invest in gigantic props. Tonight, on the first 30 minutes of the show, you're going to see a whole lot of big props. Uh, that is my business. It's not just my business. I like to rock and roll on stage, so I like to do the big show. But uh, you don't have to have big props. Going back to the digital age, because of what people can do with video projection and cell phones, I know guys that basically do a close-up show for huge churches. So it's not about having big props, it's about knowing how to play big and thinking in terms of whatever you do, a lot of people need to be able to see it. So you should assume somewhere along the line you're going to have a bigger opportunity. So my suggestion practically is when you invest in things, get the biggest thing you can afford and handle, not the small thing. And uh, right with that, don't say yes to churches that want you to do a big show if you're really not able to do it because it's just going to hurt the, the ministry in general. They're going to say, well, we had a gospel magician before, and we're never going to have one again, because it just didn't work. Uh, obviously, a key to thinking big is showmanship, <coughs> which means it's even more crucial to learn how to handle a crowd, how to be artistic on stage, how to command attention. I think in the past, a lot of what was done in the name of gospel magic was really little more than doers of tricks, doing tricks, and adding, adding some Bible verses. And that's not wrong. I think there's a place for that, especially in the smaller churches and the little situations. But the point is that doesn't work in the big church. And it doesn't work for larger groups. We have to become communicators. We have to become showmen. And you say, well, I don't want to be a showman. Do you want to communicate? Do you want to connect with people? Then you need to learn how to effectively hold the attention of an audience. Ties right in with that. Number seven, gospel magicians need to forget about having a big setup or a lot of tables on stage. This is another thing that has changed with this century and the end of the last century. Up until the late 1980s, the average American church for music had an organ on one side, a piano on the other, a guy who stood in the middle and did this kind of thing. Well, everybody sang out of hymn books. Does that happen nowadays? Almost never. No. Nowadays, churches have drastically changed their approach. It's rare to find a church that has a piano on one side and organ on the other. And it's rare to find choirs. Nowadays, you show up and there's drums and a keyboard and all kinds of mic stands. And there's a praise team, a worship team. When I was growing up, hatred hey, you know, <coughs> man, you never heard of that kind of thing. And I remember when it first started, a lot of church thought that was a bad thing. Why would you want to do that? But now pretty much everybody does that, and who uses hymn books nowadays? They're singing from the words off the wall. What does this mean for the gospel magician? It means when you show up, you can't plan on setting up a variety of equipment because their stuff is going to be in the way. The mic stands, the cords, all this kind of stuff is going to be out there. Your props may interfere with their projection. Mary and I use a backdrop when we travel. But in the big churches, I set it off to the side somewhere where I can put my stuff behind. I don't even try to get it out in the center because I know if I interfere with the worship music, it's going to hinder the ministry and it's going to have some folks upset with me. And as far as tables go, I, I don't set anything out there. I have it so when I time for me to come on, I carry my stuff out with me. The picture you see up here is the old style suitcase table. And I don't mean to step on anybody's toes. That's not my point at all. I'm just simply saying... Time, we have to change. We have to accept the world is not the way it was before. This used to be the big kind of thing for magicians. This is what many thought the ideal table. Uh, you would set it up on stage. It, this, this top area folds up from the bottom. and it's, it does, it's on wheels, but it's real hard to roll it out. So you want to have it set. You want stuff up on top of that. Nowadays, the praise team is going to be in the way. They're gonna, people are going up and down the music. They're going to bump things off. Uh, that's just not the most practical way to do it. Uh, nowadays, you're going to face a different situation, and my recommendation is we start rethinking tables so that they roll on. Uh, that's not necessarily the perfect example, but the, how that table is designed is a box on top. Everything is in the top, and what's setting on the top there, I took out of the top. You can see the drums in the background and stuff. So when I started, I just grabbed the table behind me, 
rolled it out with me, reached inside, set the stuff on top, and could go. And basically, I have a program designed where I start with an empty stage and I finish with an empty stage. And I think we need to accept the reality that that is the best way to do things. Now, there are still situations where you can go out and set up extra tables. And I know that there's times when you, when, the, the, when the certain props, I should, maybe should say tricks, and you just need that extra table, you need that extra base. Uh, so it can happen, but my suggestion is with that, recruit somebody in the church, show them how to carry it out and put them in place. And be mentally prepared for that. Because you're rarely going to get an opportunity where before the service starts, you can just fill up the stage with all your magic. Now having said that, and having said it as firmly as I just did, you know, there are certain denominations and styles where they still are very traditional. And you can count on the fact that there will be an open stage area. So maybe you're in a group where you can still do it the old-fashioned way. And it's so more power to you. But I certainly recommend knowing how to get on and off stage fast. Number eight, gospel magicians must learn to do the time and no more than the time. And this is another matter that has become a larger concern because of another aspect of ministry, which is really new in our time, comparatively new. And that is the idea of churches having multiple services. Uh, when I was young, I never heard of a church that had multiple services. You can pretty much count that some church is going to start at 11 and be done at 12. Or maybe, you know, those folks that are sort of liberal would start at 10 and get out at 11 so they could have more playtime, but they weren't as spiritual as those of us who stayed in church till noon, or whatever it was. But the, the idea of multiple services is a relatively new thing. But now it's become a very big thing. Well, what is one of the things it mandates? You've got to stay on schedule. Uh, the service has to finish at a certain time because they've got to get people out and new people in. And they've got Sunday school and transportation issues and music issues. And so uh, it's always, I think it's always been important to do the time. To me, it's a matter of honesty. If I tell you I'm doing 20 minutes and I don't do 20 minutes, I'm not honest with you. So I've always been committed to time. But nowadays, I think it's even more crucial. A lot of the big churches you go to, uh, I'll show up in these churches, and they have it like 10 o'clock is the first song, 10.03 is the opening prayer, 10.07 is the announcements, you're going to go on at 10.22. And they expect the service to follow that kind of thing. And to people who say, well, I just don't think that's spiritual. I don't think that allows for the Holy Spirit. Well, I have a lot of thoughts on that. But one is, the Holy Spirit can lead you to prepare. Uh, who, who came up with this idea that if it's not spur of the moment, it's not Holy Spirit? The Spirit can lead it to spur of the moment, but the Spirit inspired the Scripture, which is full of things that tell us to be wise and well prepared. And beyond that, if you're simply called into a ministry situation, you need to be a blessing to them. So if they say 10 minutes, you do 10 minutes. If they say 20 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever it is, you learn to do that and not a minute more. And I'm going to tell you this, and file it away, please, because it'll keep you, from, keep you from problems. Don't let them talk you into doing more, and don't be seduced by this idea, oh, it's so much fun, you can do an extra five. Yeah. Uh, you may think they're really loving it, but when you're gone, they're going to remember you went long. And so it's going to keep you from coming back again. Mm -hmm. So basically, it doesn't matter what they say, you do the time that they plan on you to play. And I realize it may sign, sign, sound hard notes, and I won't say I don't care, because I care deeply. But I will tell you, I have made up my mind that we need to change our thinking about some of these things. Because gospel magic is a tremendous tool. But if we keep shooting ourselves in the foot by doing stupid mm -hmm. things, it's never going to achieve the potential that it could achieve. There's things we just have to get straight. And we have to become more professional. Uh, we have to become more disciplined. We need to learn how long our stuff is and do what, whatever it's supposed to be. Okay, number nine. Look, push the back button instead of the forward. Gospel magicians must accept the reality that personal appearance is associated with credibility. In spite of the old saying that you can't judge a book by its cover, people do judge books by their covers. That's why they pick them up and look at them in the first place. And the uh, prevalence of visual media means the public is aware of trends and imagery. When styles change it, people know it right away. Now this is kind of entertaining for us to think about. I know Dell has pictures and I have pictures of us when we just started. 
that would get a laugh today, right? Well, I, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think you did. I had a sky blue leisure suit with a yellow open collar. You did too, PJ. A yellow open collar, you know, that yellow collar shirt that I thought was the coolest thing on earth. And then we went to the ruffled shirts with the blue tuxedo. Remember this sort of thing? Okay. Well, we experienced in the 20th century how it took, I would say, about 30 years, maybe 40 years, to transition from tuxedo to open collar shirts and sport jackets to shirts untucked and blue jeans that are ripped like this. You know, we saw the 30 or 40 years that it went from there to there. But now the 21st century has begun, and just in the less than 20 years of the 21st century, we've seen them go from untucked shirts to tucked in shirts, back to suit jackets, even neckties to come back for young performers. And, uh, and now, in 2018, a lot of the people in the entertainment world are back to rhinestones and the Liberace approach. Yeah. You know, the entertainment, they keep changing. As soon as everybody else jumps on the bandwagon, they get off. So they continue to be the center of attention. Well, the point is, styles keep changing, and we have to understand that they do, and we have to find a way to dress in a way that suggests we are still in touch. Now, that doesn't mean there's any run one right way to do it. I pulled some of these different looks off the internet, and you've got quite a contrast here. The young man in the t-shirt, and then the guy over here in the cape and the whole works. I think there's still room for a lot of different styles. There's no one way to do it. But the key is, we need to dress in a way that says to our audience, we know how they think. Because if they think we don't know how they think, then they're not going to listen to us when we try to share so we need to have a general understanding of, of how people are dressing and how it looks and then combine that with whatever our particular style is. And your style also mandates how you're going to dress. If you are more of the teacher, instructor, preacher type, well then you're not going to go over the top. You're, you, know, you can get away with it, one kind of a look. But if you're like me, you're a showman, uh, you're on the big stage, well then, rhinestones and uh, bling, here I come. The older I get, the more bling I can get away with, and I think the more bling I need. But the whole point is, you need, it's not a matter of there's one way to do it or copy how everybody else does it, but it's a matter of use your head to think about your appearance and your audience and how these things mesh together and understand people really pay attention to style and change. And so we need to adapt to that. I, I, by the way, the notes. There's 28 worth, pages worth of notes here that I'm going to put up. But I'm skipping a lot of the material because I just didn't think you wanted to hear me talk that long. But one of the things that I did elaborate on in the notes is that I think most of us, whatever we started performing in is what we're still comfortable in. You know, I started preaching in a shirt and tie. I still have a terrible time preaching without a tie on. You know, it's just that's the way I always was. My son, he started out in blue jeans and untucked shirt. He was that generation. I, you know, you know, he, but he's smart enough to change with the times. He actually wears a tie now. But I think he's always going to be most comfortable in jeans and an untucked shirt. But the point is, it's not about us being comfortable. It's about us being credible. And so when it changes, we change. And the church always seems to be behind. You know, they all went to the untucked shirt a look about the time the world started changing different. But anyway, enough said on that. Number nine, we need to be sensitive to modern taboos. In the 70s and the early 80s, there were magicians who would use this joke. They say, I'm going to do a card trick. Anybody here doesn't like card tricks? Somebody usually would say yes. They would reach into their table, pull out a handgun, load with a blank, aim it out, go bang, and they say, is there anybody else here who doesn't like card tricks? Can you believe they ever got away with that? <laughs> In about 1980, I wrote an article about that saying you shouldn't do that, and you wouldn't believe the flack I got from members of the Fellowship of Christian Magicians saying, Dwayne, it's just funny, you're, you're just bent out of shape, you know, you're, 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 well, I don't, I don't think of a nice word, but anyway, there were a lot of words they had to say to me. Uh, eventually, they caught on. You can't do that anymore. The world has changed. You can't, nowadays you do that, you're going to get hauled away. But think about different ways the world has changed. Magicians actually used to pull rabbits out of hats by the ears. Do you think that would work nowadays? No, nowadays it's got to the point where in a lot of places you, you can't even do tricks with animals. Uh, folks really they get upset about that sort of thing. 
So there's several things that I think we need to consider. Uh, number one, I think the idea of doing tricks with animals, uh, we have to become sensitive. I don't like, I don't like the fact that the circus, circuses are closing down because the people are picketing the, the idea of the elephants. I mean, I love watching the elephants. I want my grandkids to say, I don't like the fact that a lot of these things are happening, but I have to accept the fact they are. And I have to accept the fact that there are people who are going to get upset if I have an animal to show. Now, here's my opinion about that. When I was in Pigeon Forge, I had tigers. And people love tigers, and if I was in Pigeon Forge, I'd still have tigers because that's Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And you can get away with tigers in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. For a long time, you could do tigers in Branson. Frankly, I'm not sure you could do them today. There are enough people who are, are ready to picket that kind of thing. So the point is you need to know where you are. There are some places where a rabbit is still a great thing in a magic show. But there are other places where there are folks who are going to be upset and they're not going to want that. And they're, going to, they're not going to take you serious because you've got an animal on the show. And my point is know your audience, know your culture, use your head. Uh, I've taken all animals out of our show. Uh, now instead of tigers, I have pretty young ladies in tiger suits. And frankly, it's just about as effective. <laughs> but the point is, we've got to think. We've got to accept the fact. The world's changing, like it or not. So we need to analyze what we have to do. Fire in a show. Wow, has the world changed with this. One of the first things I did when I was still in college doing gospel magic is I got a, a um, refill tube of uh, butane it had a little nozzle on the top. I don't know, I think they used a trigger or whatever. I hooked a plastic hose on it. I put the refill butane container here, run the, the hose up uh, around my back, down my arm here. I would push the button to fire out the butane, light a cigarette lighter, make a big flame of you know, fire burst out of my hand. I thought that was so cool. And the first thing I ever heard from Tannen's Magic was called Devil's Dragon's Breath. Remember that? Dragon's Breath. Which was shooting this fire out from your hands. And we did tricks with candles, we did tricks with piles of flash paper, on the list goes. The world has changed. There's been some tragedies relating to fire in uh, small settings. And because of that, we just have to realize that you know, the world thinks differently than they used to. Uh, there, you know, this, uh, I'm not sure just really how much to elaborate on this, because I think you understand what I'm telling you. but. Uh, Nowadays, for Christmas programs, instead of real candles, we use the LED candles. And believe me, in theaters and churches, there are very strict no-fire rules nowadays. And I've heard people say, gospel magicians say, better to uh, beg, for, beg forgiveness and ask permission. Is that really the attitude of Christians have? I don't think so. And I think it's another thing that can keep you from ever getting invited back again. And it can keep other uh, people from recommending you to another place. If the rule's no fire, no fire. Now, I'm extremely careful about it. I still use fire in a couple of settings. Uh, we have a fire cage trick. I just have a little lighter, a small little thing. But if I show up at the theater and they don't want that, I have a plan so I can get by without it. Tonight, I think we're going to have a little thing done with flash paper. We have a, fla we have a, a fire extinguisher right there. And it's under control, and it's my theater, so we can do that because uh, I have you know, used my head about safety. So the point is, I'm not saying you totally have to take that stuff out of your show, but we simply have to understand that this is a new thing for our world. And as much as I love fire tricks, I don't think it's smart to plan on fire tricks in the show. Uh, by the way, I still do the Fantasio candles. I still do a cane and candle act. I just don't like the candles, and nobody seems to care. So use your head about this. Whether you agree with me or if you do disagree with me, you better think it through long and hard and make sure you know why you disagree and it makes sense to. Uh, I've just had to accept it. So I used to have a lot of cool fire tricks. And frankly, in the back, I have some very expensive fire tricks that if you would like to buy, I would be glad to sell them. <laughs> because I can't use them anymore. It's just all there is to it. Okay. Lack of respect for um, foreign... For foreign, what's the word? Children's oh, shows. Right. I have up there. I can remember exactly how I wrote it. Another thing in the past century, popular to have our props decorated with so-called Chinese designs. A lot of these times, we had no idea what those designs meant. We just thought we knew what they meant. And how many of you remember when it's popular for a magician to do a Chinese act? <laughs> Dress up in the pigtails, talk in a kind of a mocking sing-song sort of a thing. All supposed to be Oriental act. I don't think that would work nowadays. 
I, I think people would become a whole lot more sensitive. Tom Brady's agent, the football player, is Asian. And recently, uh, in fact, just last week, people from a television station got fired because they just meant it to be funny, but they were mocking his accent, the Asian's accent. Out they went, just like that. That's the way the world has changed. My point is not compromise who we are. My point is reach people for Christ. Yes. And if we're going to reach them for Christ, and if something like that will alienate, I may think those old oriental things are really cool, but I'm going to redecorate my prop if I plan to use it in a show where I want to do things in a ministry setting. Final, oh, uh, a positive note here before I get off of this. One way the world's changed, which isn't, uh, if I sound negative today, forgive me, but uh, it isn't negative, is playing cards. When I first started in gospel magic ministry, which goes back almost 50 years, um, playing cards in church was a pretty big no-no, almost okay. everywhere. Nowadays, I'm amazed and I still can't get over it. Nobody seems to care. Now, you may, be in, you may be in a very conservative church where they still care. I'm sure there are some that still care, and there are those that don't approve of magic and all this. But generally speaking, card tricks and work in church do work nowadays. Last but not least, number 10, we must have a commitment to excellence. In the past, a lot of people may only see one or two gospel magicians in their lifetime. If they did see a magician, they really didn't have much to compare it with. Nowadays, we have YouTube. And we have social media. And we've got Robert you know, live streaming this thing today in the back. And that means people can compare whatever they see and hear with whatever they see and hear. we got Facebook where people are going to talk about whatever they think they saw you do. And if it was lame, they're going to say so. If a performer is sloppy in this day and age, the world is going to know about it right away. In fact, you might go viral. And the sad thing about it is if you are a gospel magician and you did something that resulted because you, were, uh, you didn't practice like you should have, uh, you simply didn't study the issue, you were stupid, if that goes viral, people use it to mock the faith and mock the ministry, and it creates barriers. I think it's always been important to perform with excellence. Uh, the bottom line is if it doesn't look like you know what you're doing, people assume, assume you don't know what you're talking about. So there's always been a need to look like you know what you're doing. But more than ever before, that needs to be done because of the way the world sees things. And, uh, of course, the other side of this, which is the positive side of it, is competence leads to assumed, assumed credibility. And our modern world is not as smart as it thinks it is. People still have the idea that if you're good at one thing, whatever you say must be true. I mean, this is why they hire professional basketball players to advertise underwear. I do not believe there is any professional basketball player who knows more about underwear than I do. But nobody offers me $20 million to endorse underwear. But for some reason, if he's a pro basketball player and he endorses underwear, people think, well, it must be good. He says so. And others, if you're good at one thing, people seem to think you're an expert on everything. That's not the way it works, but that's the way people think. So my point is, if we learn to perform with greater skill, if we really do develop this matter of excellence, people are going to give us a better hearing. Fundamentally, no longer can we have a good old boy approach to gospel magic. It's time to respect our ministry, the artistic aspect of it, the craft aspect of it. It's time for us as individual performers to insist for ourselves that we do what we do extremely well. And it's time for any organization promoting gospel magic to insist that things from now on be well represented. We must demand high standards for those who teach and perform at our events. And what it comes down to at the end here is we need to be earnest and intense about making the message of the gospel and God's truth heard and understood. And what that really then means is uh, the message matters the most. Obviously the message matters the most. We're not about tricks. We're not about just messing around and, and having fun with our magic. I love to have fun. I love to mess around with it. But when we're talking ministry and we're talking about being in the platforms of churches, we are there to effectively show people biblical truth and the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, I very much appreciate you listening to me. Um, yeah, I think you can tell these things are much on my heart. Uh, special thanks to Carrie Kistler and Dr. Chris Beck. They are the two who started talking to me not long ago about the whole idea of let's, let's, let's identify how the world has changed 
and what are some of the things that especially need to be on our minds as we move into this 21st century. So you got preached at. Thanks for putting up with it. That's the end of this particular session.